The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents a discussion about street epistemology with Anthony Magnabosco. All right, so welcome. The Atheist Debates Project covers a lot of different things. We'll be getting back to more debates, more debate reviews, and more specific arguments uh, in 2017. But I wanted to kind of close out the year by having my friend Anthony Magnabosco, who lives in San Antonio. He was gracious enough to drive all the way up from San Antonio to Austin. Says, what would it take you, like an hour and some change? It was an hour and a half. An hour and a half. Yeah, a little traffic. Not too bad. But I've driven down there. He's driven up here. But we hadn't actually done this. I mean, you know, he sat in. We, we did atheist experience stuff. And I thought it'd be a good idea because you are like the world's foremost advocate, expert, practitioner of what's called street epistemology. So why don't we start off explaining as best you can to what street epistemology is and maybe how you found out about it and got started. And then we'll get on to, you know, sure. pros and cons and lessons learned. and Love it. Love it. Yeah. So street epistemology originated with Dr. Peter Bogosian's book. He wrote a book called The Manual for Creating Atheists. And I think it came out in 2013. I think we're coming up, coming up on the third year anniversary of when, at least when I read it, which I think was a few months after it came That's, out. That seems right. Yeah. And we can look it up. Yeah, I think it was 2013. That's what I've been telling people for a long time, so hopefully that's true. And I read it and thought, ooh, this is good. I want to give this a try. Because I wanted to do something atheist-related, something for the movement. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, maybe I'll do a podcast or something. I didn't know what to do. But I did know that I liked speaking with people. And... I actually had seen a video where Daniel Moscato, the former PR director of Atheist, yeah. American Atheist, was engaging with these street preachers, and the way that she was arguing with them appealed to me. Like I thought, oh, that's she's so knowledgeable; she knows what's there's going a, on. There's a lot of that. There's I've engaged with preachers on the street. I know Aaron has. I know plenty. I've seen videos from people. There's a lot of different styles and methods. That's right. That's right. But you know when but I when street I, epistemology focuses on kind of one list of goals or methods or it's, it's, style. De- it's definitely different than debating and mm-hmm. when I found myself debating with the street preachers I didn't it just didn't appeal to me honestly like I it was like I'd seen people doing it but I didn't feel comfortable doing it but the funny thing is is that I initially went out intending to do street epistemology but was kind of going about it all wrong it wasn't until I started rereading the book seeing exa- seeing examples of hearing of examples of people that are doing it, you know, that were doing it back then in the, there's a private street epistemology Facebook group, sure. which is awesome. I, if anyone's interested in that, I'd recommend that they uh, join that. And I was posting my horrible videos of me arguing with people <laughs> and I was getting feedback from them. Bogosian started noticing cause I was tweeting the links, you know, and he would write back like uh, more modeling behavior, you know, less arguing, that type of stuff. These little cryptic things. I'm like, well, Okay. So I'll go out the next week and try that and get a little bit better at it. But um, so maybe just to take a step back, like street epistemology yeah. is, it's not debating. At least it shouldn't be. It's, it, it's, a, it's a dialectical approach based on the Socratic method that the object there is to simply ask questions of the person that you're speaking with so that you can encourage them to explain to you what they believe and how they concluded that it's true. So you're basically asking what they believe and why. Yeah, more more or less. But but done. It, hey, wait, we can stop now. I've been doing this for a dozen years. <laughs> Surely I must be doing street epistemology, and <laughs> I have to be doing it right, right? <laughs> well, here's the thing. While while I am somewhat interested in what they believe and why, it's the how that's important. Yeah. It's the method they use to get to the belief, because we can spend hours talking about the Bible and how it was constructed and the, the, the contradictions that are in there. But if somebody's not believing that their God exists because of the Bible right, and because there are a, an apparent lack of contradictions, if that's, if that's the reasons why, if that's, if those aren't the reasons why they say that they believe, then I don't really care about those. So SE is more about putting aside all, all the noise and focusing on the root cause of why they believe. And when it comes to a God belief, it's almost always fake. Or at least after the discussion, after a period of time where people are pushed back towards a corner where they they start to realize that the reasons they thought they believed that they were giving have all been shot down, then it gets back to faith. Yeah, faith is usually that last vestige yeah. that people go to when, when they realize that, oh boy, I don't have evidence. Um, saying that I was raised with this belief really isn't 
you know, kind of a wise thing to say because I recognize that other people are raised with beliefs. And then faith is usually the fallback position. Now, a minute ago, you mentioned you got feedback from uh, Boghossian about yeah. you know, more modeling behavior. Uh, for the people who don't know, we should probably tell them what modeling behavior is. And when you're like in the field doing street epistemology, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's easy to say that this is essentially, that, oh, there's nothing new. It's just the Socratic method. It's just asking questions. But... Clearly, the Socratic method isn't just, you know, do you like peanut butter? The, the questions have to relate to what they're saying mm-hmm. and what they're thinking. And it's, it's really, a, the Socratic method is really a steering technique. So what is it about street epistemology that might differ from just a normal Socratic method? Mm. Um, do, you, do you have like a, a list of steps that you're going through? Mm. Do you have some, what's going through your mind while the person's sitting, standing there in front of you? Um, answering questions about their beliefs. Oh, there's a lot there. Okay, so uh, like your last guest, your previous guest, I'm not, uh, I don't have a degree, degree in philosophy. I really couldn't tell you much about what S- Socrates' life or whatever, but um, I do know that the that street epistemology is loosely based on the Socratic method. What I think makes it different, though, is um, I like to, rather than propose a topic, and, and maybe guide them to a certain point, mm-hmm. I like to encourage them to tell me what they think is true. Give me a claim. And then we just go where they, where they take me. So uh, these days, I'll even just ask people, like I go out on the street, maybe even to get a little more background. I like to go out on the street and initiate talks with people. You don't have to do that. I can wait till I'm in an airplane and somebody says, you know, they have a Bible and I can just start a chat with them or something or they make some sort of claim. But I like to just go where they take me um, because this approach is quite versatile. It doesn't always sure. have to be about a God belief. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, <laughs> but well, I, I love the versatility a, of it. Is there like a step one, step two, step uh, three thing that people, you know, it's funny or, because, or a starter? Okay. Pack, so a, the street epistemology starter pack model. So Boghossian wrote his book. Yep. Several people that have been using it, using the method for, for a few years now, have put together a street epistemology guide. It's a field guide. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, it's on the SC website, streetepistemology.com. You can download it. And it's it's based on feedback from people who have actually gone out and used the method. Sure. It's awesome. Is there a step-by-step guide or, or script? Some people watch enough of my videos to then feel comfortable enough to go out and have a talk with somebody and be further along the learning curve than I ever was when I first went out. In a, in a way, I think the script, if there is even a script, Mm -hmm. I even hate to say the word script, Yeah. but if, if there was a script, if it encourages people to want to have the talks, then I'm fine. Even at the risk of it possibly looking insincere. So kind of a, I mean, you've got plenty of clips up and we'll, we'll put a link to Basically, Anthony will go out with a camera on and record this and then edit it. Um, It's interesting to watch because while no two conversations are exactly the same, uh, there's certainly commonalities that that come up. Um, Mm. And you you, you also get to watch people's mannerisms and responses. Um, And I like how in some of the videos you'll highlight, oh, they just looked at the camera or things along those lines. Here's we we had this discussion before, and as someone who's done a TV show for eleven or twelve years, and I'm a huge fan of the Socratic method, you know the whole the TV show is tell me what you believe and why. We don't always stick to just a Socratic method. I'm happy to point out, no, 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 that's a fallacy. That's wrong. Um, yeah, that may not always be the best way. M- maybe that in some situations my way is worse. And in some situations, the street epistemology way is worse. And in some cases, there's an overlap. It's not like, I think that so many people are looking for a magic bullet. Mm. We need to fix the world, get rid of superstition and irrationality. And there must be one way to do that. And I I personally think that's wrong. I think that um, what, what I see you doing in, in street epistemology is certainly one way. I have a way that's 
I have a number of ways, I suppose, because there are occasions where people will say, ah, you're doing street epistemology. Mm -hmm. And there are other occasions where they'll be, you're doing it wrong. (laughs) And then there's another situation where they're like, oh, what you did there was awesome no matter what it is. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the kind of, you know, I've, I've certainly been an ass in conversations before. Uh, and sometimes that has worked. I won't say that that's never a good thing. I just don't have it as the goal or the starting point. Mm-hmm. And since street epistemology doesn't, I mean, it's not, as you mentioned, it's not tied to atheism or uh, religious beliefs. It can be used for anything. It's it kind of, I think probably one thing we could do is say, well, I almost want to just say, try do it, do it to me. I know. I, I, do, I, I, as I was driving, I was like, me. "Is Matt going to ask me to try this on him?" Please I'm, convince me that I'm wrong about something using street <laughs> epistemology. But to your point, like I do think that there are a variety of tools available to humans mm-hmm. to engage with other people about the claims that they that they make. You can be an ass. You can be confrontational. Uh, you can use the more gentle approach of street epistemology. I think it's all about where a person is in their journey from belief to non-belief of a particular claim. But if I, if, and that we're just getting your opinion. I'm not saying that you are the, you know, the Lord High Almighty about street epistemology. Oh, I want to talk about that too. If so. I'm, if I'm wanting to go out and try out street epistemology, I can go to the website, find information that's mm-hmm. been collected by people. What in your mind should be in my mind when I'm doing this? Mm, okay. Oh, I don't want to lose that thought, but I just want to quickly address the... Just very quickly, I'm not the arbiter of street epistemology. Peter Bogosian even is, it will admit that he's not. Like, there are no popes, there are no leaders. We want people to experiment sure. with different styles. So just keep that in mind. Um, this is not some dictate from on high as, what, as, sure. as far as what SE should be. If you wanted to go out and talk to people, and again, you don't have to go out and talk to people, initiate the talks. I do it because right. I want to be good at it. This can practice. happen organically on a plane, and we'll get to... Preferably. I, th- I think the best conversations happen when it happened to me. I was on an airplane, and I was wearing a Atheist Voter t-shirt, mm-hmm. and some guy was... We were waiting for our luggage, you know, the carry-on thing, and he's like... Uh, it was really hot in there, and I was like sweating and stuff, and the guy's like, you like the heat, huh? Yeah, it's like pointing at my shirt. So I'm like, well, okay. So people like Which started. He, was that a hell reference? Yeah, it was. It oh was. wow. So, anyways, we got off the jetway. We started talking, and I was doing SC, and it turned out that that he was he was evidence based. So that goes a slightly different direction. But anyways, the point is, is that I think the best conversations happen when they are they are organic. Um, as far as a list of things that you might want to consider when you go out, have an open mind. Be willing to change your mind. And I think you are. I've seen enough of your interactions where I think that you are. If somebody had a good argument, they can change my mind about anything. All right. Uh, yeah. Except possibly absolute certainty. But Okay, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, listen. Take the time. People will respect you more, I think, if you actually show that you're interested in what they're saying and you're repeating it back so that they can not only see that you're you're getting it, but they hear back their own words. I think that's an important thing pausing when somebody says something like profound that they may have never thought of before like i guess when it really comes down to it i i believe it because it just makes me feel good i can sleep better at night when i have this belief okay boom boom a few seconds there's a, of pausing. There's a couple of things that happen that make the pausing worthwhile and i'm not speaking with regard to se just me mm. and i talk a lot and i talk fast and on the TV show, I'm trying to have a conversation that moves along. And you don't want dead air. I, this is yeah. one of the problems with the show. Because yes. I already recognize that there's a huge benefit to pauses. And it's not just so that ever Like, if you say something, you know, oh, I just have to believe it because of faith. The, the pause that comes after that isn't just to let that sink in with whoever else might be listening. Watch the person who just said it. Because if you're having a back and forth conversation and all of a sudden there's a pause, we naturally say, hang on, what caused this pause? Mm. And they're going to go, they're going to say, you know, I, I believe because, you know, the turtles told me so. And that awkward pause makes them go, hang on, did I say something that caused this pause? There's a little bit of, 
I don't want to. I don't want to imply that it's like a trick of self consciousness, but it allows them to reflect on what was said. Precisely. Because if they if they say I believe because the turtles told me so, and you immediately jump in with yes, but the turtles, or right. well, why would you think the turtles tell you anything? If instead you pause, they're asking those questions before you do. In some sense, they may not be exactly the same as you'd phrase it. Yeah, that's that's. Oh yeah, there's so many technical issues that I think the format of the atheist experience it makes. It, and I've done, I've done, I've, I've experimented with doing something similar over Blab, where we have people that you're basically doing video chat in SE. Mm -hmm. But I think there's nothing better than face to face. Um, the pausing is, is critical. It, it it does help people think about what they've just said and reflect on it. And and that's such a big part of it is that street epistemology is not about me telling people what to think it's about them saying what they think and then thinking about what they think because that very process seems to be the most effective path to change now see here's where we get into the interesting area where i have issues <laughs> which which we've discussed before so i'm not having anthony with anything new uh on the pro side for street epistemology awesome it's the socratic method how are you going to argue against that uh, uh, okay, maybe you could. Uh, you'd have to ask questions to argue against it. But so that's beneficial. There's a non-confrontational aspect of it that I think is wonderful because it, it encourages conversation and it doesn't, it isn't as likely to get people's defenses up uh, as some other styles. Um, although I will say that I think there's times when it's good to get somebody's defenses up because what I see happen sometimes is if they don't, get defensive at all they're no longer trying to offer a defense they're just saying whatever the next thing that comes into their right mind. or if somebody's not willing to to defend their position you have to question well how invested are they into this thing yeah like how is this really a belief that's influencing them or are they pretty apathetic about the whole thing like i, I that's another reason why i'm, like, I'm not to no, throw go ahead. you up but that's another reason why i like to have people pick the belief that we can unpack together sure because you know when i first went out i was just like I'm an atheist. Tell me about your God belief. Why do you believe in God? But they just, they might be an atheist who thinks that they have a soul. But that would be an interesting topic. Or they think karma is real. And it drives their behavior on a daily basis. So let's pick the thing that tends to influence your behavior the most and see if it pairs with reality. So this is where we get to one of the potential cons. Because you said that you view SE as um, a, a decent path towards change. Mm -hmm. Or I don't remember the exact language. But it... it, it I'm not as convinced, although I think certainly there's positives about it. Any sort of self-reflection, any sort of let me take inventory of what I believe and why, you know, do I have good reasons for this? Uh, that's always important, and I think that th those things are critical to changing minds. But street epistemology, when Boghossian first, it was in his book, A Manual for Creating Atheists, mm -hmm. and yet I don't see that SE has creating atheists as its goal. And I'm not even convinced that SE has changing minds as its goal. It, when I watch, for example, one of the first questions after you establish what belief you're going to be talking about is you ask them how confident they are that they're right. Mm -hmm. And then you have this Socratic dialogue. And then you ask them again how confident they are. We try to do a pre-test and a post-test yeah. where they are in the terms of the confidence of the belief. Yeah. And so the thing that keeps coming up is this. Let's say... I actually am 100% confident. Mm -hmm. And you, when you ask me how confident I am, I say, oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. Now we have a long conversation. Actually, not too long. Usually, usually, what, 5 to 15 minutes or so? Yeah, usually. We have this conversation, and at the end, you ask me how confident I am, and now I say I'm 75% confident. Mm -hmm. So we can look at that. If In that scenario, we've reduced my confidence in my beliefs. Okay. Because okay. I'm saying I actually came in at 100. Yeah, yeah. Then scenario two is, let's say I'm actually only 75%, but when asked, I think I'm 100 or I say I'm 100. And at the end of the conversation, I report correctly at 75. Mm. Mm -hmm. In that sense, we haven't changed anything about my confidence level. We've changed what I'm willing to say about my confidence right. level. Right. It's, it's maybe uh, we've possibly improved your willingness to report an accurate representation of your level of confidence. Do you, how are you with that? No, I, that's, that's, see, that's my point. But, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, 
Even, even, okay, so there are videos where people don't change their confidence when I talk to them. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't re-report it as something sure. else. Um, there are times where they, they will decrease 100 to 60. I'm 100% sure prayer works. Now I'm 60% sure. There are times where they, uh, there's one example where a woman just recently, she said she was 90. But as we were talking and she glanced at my camera, she, she self-reported at 100 so the, the numbers do vary. Um, regardless of where a person, I don't know where I was going with that, but I, but I, I don't know. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, it's, so I'll, it'll probably there's a scenario, there. there's scenario where my reported confidence doesn't match my actual confidence. Mm -hmm. Then there's a scenario where it does match. Mm -hmm. And in both of those, we can change the final report. In the first case, all, we're, all we might be doing is getting them closer to an accurate report. In the second case, what we might be doing is actually lowering their confidence level or making them realize that they should not be as confident or cannot be as confident. Yeah, yeah. But here's the thing. Let's say I have this belief that prayer works. And I start off reporting that I'm 90% confident that prayer works. And we have the discussion. We find out I'm actually talking about, you know, intercessory prayer. Maybe God helps you find your car keys. Maybe he cures your cancer. Maybe he gets traffic out of the way so you make it somewhere on time. Anything where I'm appealing to a God, I'm 90% confident that it works. And we have this conversation, this dialogue, and you ask questions like, you know, what makes you think that this is the case? How often have you, have you, have you taken any sort of polling to see... What about when the answer is no? How do you tell the answer is no? How do you distinguish uh, prayer from coincidence? Uh, yeah, the, boom. And at the end of all this, instead of being ninety percent confident, I say I'm fifty five percent confident, mm -hmm. and we part ways. Right. I still believe prayer works. Sure, sure. And, and is it is it in is it actually likely that it's in affecting my life any less? Mm. Well, that's a good question, and and a lot of this comes down to the the figure that's being reported to me. Like, I don't really know if you're just telling me that you're less confident. Maybe maybe you feel like let's assume people are being truthful. I, as, I as have truthful to. As we can. really don't have much choice. Yeah, like I guess I, I can probably observe you and put cameras and have the NSA like monitor you. But now uh, there was a facial tick when he said fifty five percent, so it's right. actually thirty two. Yeah. So yeah, you really can't. I can't second guess you and say, well, no, he was, he wasn't really telling me the truth or he was, I can only go off of what you're telling me at that point. But I think whether somebody, whether somebody adjusts their confidence or not. And I think that what I was getting back, what I just remember what I was going to say in the examples of the videos that are on my channel, I think there are clear instances where it's, I'm fairly confident that they've dropped their confidence. Like I think, like the, the example that I played... How confident I, are you? I'm 80% confident. If we had a dialogue, <laughs> would that drop to 50? Possibly. See? Possibly. I'm willing to change my mind. I, I don't want to... By the way, for everybody watching, I'm not remotely trying to be glib. We're having a bit of fun with this. Uh, for clarity, I am in favor of the methods of street epistemology. I just have concerns and doubts about what is it actually accomplishing? Mm. Because there's a number of things it could be accomplishing. Number one, it could be changing how people report their confidence level in their belief. Mm -hmm. It could be, two, changing their actual confidence level in their belief. Yeah. But if we're not actually eliminating those beliefs, then people are still, they, they still hold those beliefs and may still be acting on them. So right, if you believe right. that um, uh, abortion is murder and should be outlawed, which is a probably, I don't know if you've had an essay on that. When it comes time to voting on it, you really have to choose a yes or a no. Right? Yeah, whether I'm 90% confident or 60% <laughs> confident isn't going to change the actions that I take that, that much. Yeah. What, it, what it might do is change how confident, how, how likely I am to try and go out and change somebody else's mind. Because if you're 95% if you're mm. confident that there's a God and he answers prayer then you may be going out and sharing that. Mm -hmm. But if you've had your confidence knocked down to maybe 60%, you might be less likely to go out and mm -hmm. you know, share those things. Yeah, I think it does change people's behavior to a certain degree. So like, yeah, if, if somebody's less confident in their belief, they may be less willing to act out on it and, and maybe do something rash or um, you know, maybe vote a particular way. So 
I, I just want to make sure I hit this one point that there are people that it does seem to be that that do seem to be completely lowering their confidence in the belief. Like the talk that I had with a woman about karma, I presented it uh, to your group and you were you were in the back mm-hmm. watching. Yeah, like she dropped from an eighty two to like a fifty seven. These really arbitrary numbers. Like, and we talked again and she dropped it even lower. Like, I think she was really abandoning her belief in karma. But like the guy that said, I'm 100% sure prayer works. And then after the end of an 11 minute talk, he said, I'm a 60. I think he, I think a case could be made that he probably always was at a 60, but there were social expectations that were holding him back from verbalizing that. But to your point, um, but to your point, I think that, yeah, I think I think in a way that this does influence the way that people will carry out activities because of the beliefs that they hold. And they might scale it back a little bit. Like, yeah, maybe they'll skip that protest because they're not as confident in it. But when it comes to voting for something, well, yeah, maybe they'll still pull the lever for their cause. And these things take time, too. Like, sure. I mean, I'm having five to ten minute talks with a complete stranger that's self-reporting two different numbers. And sometimes I, I forget to even use the scale. I, sometimes I just don't ask it or I say, you know, I'd like to get an idea of where you are, but if you don't want to do the scale, we don't have to do it. Sure. And then they just say, well, I'm not, I'm not I don't want to put a numerical value on it. That's stupid. Do you think that it changes the labels they're likely to use to identify themselves? Um, so if somebody walks mm-hmm. in and says, oh, I'm a Christian or whatever label they would use to say I, I believe karma is real I think they put a modifier on it so they might say I'm a strong Christian and now I'm, I'm a lukewarm Christian or something like that mm-hmm. or I'm progressive you know I think they might put an adjective on there um, which goes to my view if, if you look at my Twitter profile like I've changed it I, I still have agnostic atheists but now I have three out of a hundred listed up there because I love the numerical scale in terms of confidence and doubt I think I mean, we see, like, Sam Harris will use the term agnostic to mean undecided. And people, you, how many times have we, you, you've had calls of people that, like, our understanding, even though we're probably on the same page with what an agnostic atheist is, there are thousands of different variations of that. Well, I actually, even despite the fact that it appears on the Aaron Jarrett's wiki, uh, there's been so many conversations about it that I'm, I'm convinced that agnostic atheists that particular label combination doesn't make any sense because it only hmm. because knowledge being a subset of belief if you're using atheism as I don't believe this as opposed to atheism as I believe there are no gods so mm-hmm. agnostic atheist doesn't apply to atheist in the soft atheist context it can only apply in the hard atheist context but see the average person on the street have, have, they have vague understanding. They, that, they don't know any of this. Yeah, they don't. We spend way too much time on it. We're invested, invested in it and all this stuff. I, wa- I did two uh, talks at two different universities here in Austin. Got amazing feedback. Something uh, Completely unexpected feedback. I went in and talked. I gave kind of like an Atheism 101. Mm. Interacted and took Q&A. Um, these are two small classes. Maybe a dozen people in each one of them. Uh, th- the feedback that I got is that there's two people who weren't atheists before I walked in, and now there are two people who are now atheists, mm. or at least struggling with it. Was beliefs. that just because they finally understood what the term meant? Yes. Or did... okay. it was, part of it was about the term, but part of it was about giving the justification for not believing. Mm. It reminds me, when I was kind of finding my way out of religion, um, I, had, I had been a skeptic for years. I've said many times that it was Penn and Teller who kind of gave me permission to use the A word. And it was not that I didn't understand it. It was not that I didn't think there was a rational defense for non-belief. Um, all this had been kind of intellectually in my mind. And I had already clearly gotten to the point where I said, okay, I'm not a Christian and I don't believe in a God, but I'm not sure that I'm an atheist. I'm not sure that I use the word. <laughs> mm-hmm. There was something about Penn and Teller actually just matter of factly using the word, you know, saying, Hey, you know, we're atheists and blah, 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 blah. And just keep going. Like it was nothing yeah. that took the weight off of it mm. to where I was like, Oh, well they, I can, I get to use the word too. I can, I can do that. And these conversations that, that took place, it was, it wasn't a, an SE type thing. It wasn't a Socratic dialogue. It was me walking in, giving a lecture and then answering questions. And from their perspective, they saw somebody who met the stereotypes in some senses of being a, you know, bald, bearded, overweight white guy. 
but in other senses, I didn't match their expectations. That their view was atheists are angry. Mm-hmm. Uh, that they're rebelling against God. That the God claims are so obvious and they've been around for so long and so many people have believed them and so many people much smarter than me have have believed this. If I were to stop believing it, I'd be saying I'm smarter than those people. Oh, wow. I'm surprised people look at it that way. It's, it's a terrifying proposition that I've received many times over the course of years of the show. In fact, some people even called in and, and would say, like, you know, uh, list off the people who they say believed in God. You know, Einstein believed in God. Well, hang on a minute. He believed in supposed Spinoza's God, a non-personal God. Oh, well, you know, Sir Isaac Newton believed in God. Do you think you're smarter than Isaac Newton? Yes. On the God topic, I think my position is more reasonable and therefore colloquially, colloquially I'm smarter. Uh, this is also the guy that was, you know, looking for the secret of alchemy and other stuff. Great scientific mind. Brilliant. I'm, I'm nothing in that scientific field compared to that. And that's this thing of, of we try to label, oh, you're really smart and therefore that means you're good at everything. Like Francis Collins was the head of the Human Genome Project, knows far more about science, may in fact be smarter than me in general across the board. But if he talks about his belief in the Trinity because he saw a waterfall frozen in three, I'm smarter than him with regard to how we establish whether or not a a supernatural claim is believable. Mm -hmm. Um, But But to go back to the whole label thing, you've heard Neil deGrasse Tyson dance around the whole atheist? I've had an argument with him about it. Okay, so my, my question to you would be, would you rather him, him pick a label like agnostic or skeptic or place his, place his confidence on a scale from zero to 100? Like, wouldn't you love to hear him say he's X percent confident that a God exists? Well, one of the things about this is, and, and actually in the discussion I had with Alex the other day, this seems to be the way... Because uh, Blake, Blake had done this too, you know, judging someone's confidence level is often done in terms of, you know, how much would you be willing to bet? What kind of odds would you take yeah. on that, on that put, bet? Put something at stake. But my problem with all that is that it, it now has you cons- evaluating two propositions. Proposition A is God exists and proposition B is God doesn't exist. And you're putting those at either end of the scale and roughly trying to figure out where you are on the scale. And for unfalsifiable propositions, I can't go either direction on a scale. I can't, I, I just can't do that, which is why when we're making arguments, we assess a single claim. When, when somebody's yeah. in a courtroom, they're accused of guilt, yeah. and we evaluate whether or not we can be convinced of their guilt or not. We don't evaluate whether or not we can be convinced of innocence. We may argue that way. Mm-hmm. And, and so I have a, a slight problem with putting things on a scale like that. When it comes to somebody like Neil, what I like him to say, you know, I'm 20% confident that a God exists. What does that mean? Does that mean that he doesn't believe a God exists or he does believe and his confidence level is 20%? The latter, I think. I, I, it all depends on how you define the scale and make sure that he understands it. What I, what I can say for nearly certain is that if somebody identifies as a zero or 100, they are making a knowledge claim. Would you agree with that? Well, I don't know what zero and 100 okay, are. Okay, so... Is zero, there are no gods, and 100, there absolutely is? Right. And then everything else in between would be a belief claim. So if I'm... If, if anyone oh, reports... See, yeah, I can't do that. Huh? I, so... So if somebody reports a 1 through 99, they're saying, I believe that this is true. So if you came to me... But uh, 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 first of all, uh, maybe before we even get into this... But, okay. Most people on the street don't even naturally realize differences between belief and knowing. They'll use these words interchangeably. I don't think they think about it quite as much as, as we might. Because I think someone would say, I believe it 100%. Well, you're really saying at that point that you know it to be true, right? So that's not how I use belief and knowledge. Um, they're all belief claims. It's not like something stops being a belief claim just because you identify it as knowledge. Knowledge is a subset of belief. So everything that you say is knowledge is also a belief. Mm -hmm. And while there are philosophical ideas like justified true belief and stuff like that for defining knowledge, um, I don't think that matches what anybody really is talking about on the street. 
normally when somebody says I know, what they say, what they mean is I really, 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 really believe. Like I believe so strongly, and the definition of knowledge that I've used for this is knowledge is a belief held to a confidence level so high that it would be worldview altering to discover you were wrong. Yeah. And so if you if you came to me and said, okay, here's this scale from zero. I'm absolutely confident, absolutely certain there is no God. At 100, I'm absolutely certain there is a God. Mm -hmm. My first thing is, I'm not absolutely certain about anything. So I can't be at zero or 100. But also, uh, because the claim is potentially unfalsifiable, that means I can't move from the 50 towards zero. Mm -hmm. If it's unfalsifiable, it means I have no way to investigate to show that it's false. Mm -hmm. I have no way to confirm that no gods exist, so I'm stuck at the 50. And if there's insufficient evidence to move me towards it, I'm stuck with the 50 there, which puts you in this 50-50. Yeah. Which is why I was saying, if somebody says I'm 20% confident that there's a God, does that mean that they're 20% of the way from 50 to 100? Or are they 20% of the way from 0 to 100? Because mm. if you're, if you're mm. on the 0 to 100 and they say I'm at a 20, mm -hmm. that basically means that they're you know, within 20% of certainty that there isn't a God. Yeah. Yeah. So... So how do, you, how do you use the scale? How would you use the scale? Let's say I'm sitting here and I say, I don't believe a God exists. So I would try to get a sense of where you are in terms of your level of confidence and doubt. Um, and doubts, the word doubt actually scares a lot of people. But there's no confidence or doubt with regard to not accepting a proposition. Um... Or, or I, well, yeah, you I, say there's you, you not have necessarily no, any confidence. You could have no confidence. If you have no confidence that your God exists, then I would imagine you're probably lower on that scale. Oh, I was going with, uh, I don't believe that a God exists. But, okay, well, let's do it that way. Let's okay. let's pretend for a second, I believe a God exists. Right. Oh, I'll, I'll, put, I'll do theist mat. I will put back <laughs> on my Christian hat from when I was most active mm. in Christianity. Mm -hmm. So I believe that God exists. Yeah. And then, so on the scale, and... I mean, I want to make sure that the scale, that you're not perceiving the scale to be commitment to the belief. Because a lot of people are committed to their belief, but I'm more interested in your confidence that the belief is true. Your certainty. Okay? So 0 to 100, where 100% would be... And, and I can easily identify that distinction because okay. during the time when I was in the Navy, if you would have asked me, do you believe there's a God? I would have said yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm absolutely certain... But I'm not particularly committed to it. I'm not practicing my religion. <laughs> I'm, you know, right. I'll go out and drink with my buddies and go to the strip club and stuff like and, and I don't go to church and I don't pray all the time. So I'm not particularly committed to it, but I'm absolutely certain that a God exists. And that, that's funny too, because when I first started going out using the scale, and I think I got the idea for the scale from um and Bogosian mentions a scale briefly in his book about the Dawkins scale, I'll try to get yeah. a sense of where something is. I, that 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 scale is flipped in my mind because it goes up to seven, set in seven, and the seven is like I don't believe a God or I know a God doesn't exist. I think is where that ends. Yeah, and and but what I was getting at there though is that when I first started going out, I was asking people, "Where are you in the terms of your strength that the belief is true?" Something like that, and then people would mm. people that was awkward, but the beauty of being in that community that I mentioned before that Facebook group is I've got feedback from people that said, you know, strength is so is so subjective. Let's let's try to get an idea of where people are in terms of their confidence, their certainty that it's true. And this all goes back to, well, it's just a self-reported number. They could be sure. saying something because they think I'm a Christian and I'm there filming them and their mom might be watching. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't want to show up on Joel Osteen's thing saying I'm yeah. only 85% confident. Right. Gonna, and and yeah. here's the, the other thing too is um, somebody, like once a month somebody will say, Anthony, I want to go through all your videos and, and get an idea statistically of how many people are changing and all this stuff. And I, I tell them, please don't do that. This is not an accurate representation. Number one, because I don't upload every video that I have a conversation with. And even if I did, it still wouldn't be scientific. You've got a small sample. So you've got the videos Anthony has selected to post from the small sample of people in and around San Antonio. That have agreed to speak on to, camera. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's so many so many things about this that that are potentially poisoning the well. But no, but here's the thing: like I don't like it seems from the feedback that I'm getting, and it's personal experience. So my level of confidence fluctuates and all that. But it does seem to be 
effective in helping people re-examine why they have the belief. What are my reasons? Sure. And do they do they hold up to a little bit of scrutiny? And if they don't, if I'm struggling to explain why I believe this, then I damn well better sure better make sure that I have good reasons for it. Some people don't care and they're like, yeah, I don't have bad reasons for it, but I believe it. It makes me feel good. And other people, I think, tend to value truth a little more. And they want to replace those bad reasons, those unreliable methods, with better reasons, better methods. So I'm, I'm probably not, a, not as good of an example as the person that you're likely to run into on the street. Um, because... Well, you're skeptic. So. Well, <laughs> no, the other thing is I've spent so much time in this and I have my views about this that merely presenting me with a scale is going to be a problem. Because I have, you know, if you put the zero to a hundred with no God here and God here, mm-hmm. I already have massive objections to the scale. That, right, right. You know, and again, it's the, the whole, let's okay. so a lot, but, a lot but of let's do be... this where I'm the believer, mm-hmm. I'm Matt. Circa. Uh, 1990. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're going, we're digging way back to shortly after I got the Navy um, I was still a believer, but I wasn't a practicing, you know, Christian. I was busy with my Navy stuff. Mm. Now, when you ask me to, to assign a confidence level or, or put myself on the scale, how do you yeah. do that? You do it. So, I mean, what do you ask? I'll ask people where they are in terms of their confidence that the belief is true. Um, 100%. 100%. 100% is, I have no questions. There's no doubt in my mind. I never, 99. Okay. I, okay, so... so I never wonder about this belief at all. I have no questions about it. I'm absolutely certain that it's true. I know that it's true. That's usually how, that's sort of my, my little spiel. Yeah, and see, this is the part where, much the same way that Beth said I would never be picked for a jury because of the way my brain works. <laughs> I, I, at the time, would have been able to say that I was absolutely certain that it's true that a God exists. But I also had questions. But mm. my questions weren't hey, is it true that God exists? They were more about why are things the way they are given that God exists. The clip that I showed you, I don't know if you'll play it or not, but uh, she's wearing a bright yellow shirt and and she bounces from, she's initially 90 in terms of that scale and then she glances at the camera and I'm like, "Uh, um, put me down for 100 instead. At the end, she says, it's not so much that I have questions that he exists, I just have questions for him. Yeah. Which is kind of what you just told me. Yeah. So here, here's the position that I was in. I had been raised in belief, walked on the aisle at the age of five, was active in the church, uh, sincerely believed. Yeah. I didn't understand that I couldn't possibly have been absolutely certain about anything. So I was in a position where I thought I could be absolutely certain. And if there was one thing that I was absolutely certain about, it was that God existed. I also would have told you that I'm absolutely certain I'm not a particularly good Christian at this moment. <laughs> Um, that I have bunches of questions about why things are the way they are, but I don't think that, that those, or I didn't think that those answers were accessible. God would tell me when and if he wanted to, mm. perhaps in heaven, perhaps as I learned more, perhaps if my walk with Christ was better, etc. So I wasn't committed as a practicing believer, but I was absolutely confident. Mm. And... If you'd have presented me with a zero to a hundred scale, I would have said a hundred, and I wouldn't even have thought about the scale. And you, That's you would have thought about your commitment between... to the belief. Right? Is that right? No, my conf- my my confidence that it was true, not my commitment. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, I'll be the first to admit that because um... committed, I might have been like forty percent committed. I was basically right. running off. The okay, so you made that distinction. A lot of people get wrapped up in there, like, oh, I. I need to be committed to this because I was raised to be committed to it. And, and in this society, if you don't say that you're a Christian, it's a bad thing. Yeah. Um, but I, I know that back then, if you presented with the scale, mm-hmm. I'd just give you 100. Mm-hmm. And it would have been pretty accurately representing what I understood within myself. Yeah. And now, I can't even accept the scale because having spent so much time looking at belief and knowledge and, and confidence levels and things like that, I think the scale itself is wrong. Okay, but so we'll we'll do it. We'll, we'll continue with me as this. We're, we're guy beating the scale was, thing to death. Oh, you want to keep going? Well, um, but the, the point about the scale is that because we're skeptical and because we want to see if this approach is effective or harmful or you know a waste of time. I don't know. We we need to 
we need to quantify it somehow. Um, and this seemed to be the best way to go about doing it. Now, And it probably is. It might be. It might not be. But just like we think science is probably the best method at this point to determine what's real or not, what's true, like I think the scale is probably our best tool at our disposal, other than maybe pre, post, you know, interviews with people over extended periods of time where there's money involved and somebody's independently researching this completely divorced of the street epistemology movement. Um, we just, I mean, we're just a ragtag group of people right now yeah, yeah. trying to just see what's working and what's not. Um, hopefully there will be better tools. Hopefully it can be perfected. Perhaps just a slight changing of the wording in the delivery of the scale might tighten it just enough to make it helpful. More helpful than I think it is now. But well, it would seem that if you were, if you, you've already done something that I think is important there, which is distinguishing between your confidence level that the belief is true and your commitment yeah. to that belief. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that's a, a great distinction. Uh, I'm, I don't, I don't want to beat up the scale thing because that actually gets into a discussion that I'm going to have with Alex at some point because we talked about belief and knowledge on. Tuesday. I listened to it a little, and yeah, you guys were getting into the epistemology there. Did you use the belief scale with a caller on Sunday? I was I was doing some work, and I thought I heard in the background that you used it with somebody. Did you ask them where they were on a scale, or did I, I just doubt miss... it? Okay, uh, I, I, was, won't, I, was I like... won't say that I'm absolutely certain that yeah, I yeah. did. And you, you probably but it doesn't didn't. sound like what I would do. Okay, yeah, I, I was so, I was gonna be surprised if you had because um, well, because we hadn't had to talk about the scale. I didn't know where you stood on it. Yeah, so I was. Yeah, I thought maybe uh, I heard that out of the... So there's, there's a couple of things to hit where one of the reasons I wanted to do this and get it out now before Christmas is this. I'm getting ready to go visit family. Yeah. Um, this is going to be an That's interesting year because the conversations that I'm most concerned about have nothing to do with religion. Yeah. I am pretty sure that the political conversations that happen over the next couple of weeks as I travel around are going to be the most difficult conversations for me to not, for me to maintain composure. Mm. So when I'm on a TV show, <laughs> there's one of the, some things make good TV. I don't think while, while the street epistemology videos are, are good in an educational sense and they are certainly interesting, they don't make for good like TV, like a regular caller type thing. But good TV doesn't necessarily mean that Conflict. you're getting good results. Now I know that we're we're getting good results, and I think if you go through and watch, there's highlight reels of me on the show, and in some cases the highlight reel is just nothing but rants, not even interacting with the caller. Just here's what Matt's rant of the day is. Mm -hmm. So that we set all those aside, they have nothing to do with this. Others are me uh, basically using logical reasoning to beat someone into submission to keep knocking them back into that corner until they have to throw up their hands and say well it's faith there are others where i'm using something akin to street epistemology although i wouldn't necessarily call it that and i don't s stick to it rigidly um it, the there was this big discussion about whether we should be diplomats or firebrands and my answer has always been both and not just we need people who are firebrands and we need people who are diplomats. When I say both, I mean, I think that if you have the capacity to be both at different times in different places, then that's perf not only acceptable, it may be exactly what's needed. Because the showing of passion that often gets acu atheists accused of being angry is really just showing that you care about something. Mm. You know, um, just this week I, I did a blog post or a Facebook post, uh, because Ron Lindsay had come out and said that, you know, hey, the secular humanist community really shouldn't be that concerned about circumcision. Um, and I know that they'll talk about, you know, autonomy and consent, but, you know, you can't get consent all the time, so let's just not even worry about it. it was, that was basically his argument. And I was like, I was furious. Um, sorry that people have emotions and feel empathy and are perhaps emotional about an issue that doesn't mean that they're wrong and if your argument for something is fallacious and the response is not fallacious but also happens to be emotional you don't just get to dismiss that either that there are people who who care I, and i would argue that as humanists we have uh 
almost an obligation to care about individual bodily autonomy and consent and rights and things like that because that's what protects it. You know, we shouldn't be dismissive of those things. So to bring that back to this context, the fact that somebody gets angry or frustrated or boisterous mm-hmm. doesn't mean that they're wrong, but it can mean that people will think they're wrong, that you've just, you've just yeah. lost. And this is one of the things... You probably have more... Now, granted, you might not post the videos where you lose patience, but you probably have more patience have some than early ones anyone, anyone I've ever seen. The the common the thing that we have in common, the let's say, okay, firebrand and diplomat, if you want to use those terms, is that I think we both care. Like yes. We, we both want to change the world for the better. And, and sure, like, I can turn it up. <laughs> I've got videos, you can go back three years, when I first went out, I was arguing and debating and because I care. Like, I want to help the people that I'm talking to. But that, That's the concern that I have that I was kind of getting to, is that it can look apathetic. To argue and yell? To, to, to do street epistemology. Oh, really? It can. Oh, my gosh. It can. So you could be sitting there. Oh, and that's interesting. It could can appear that I'm not trying to change your mind. I don't really care. To, to try to change your mind. I just want to get an understanding oh. of what you mm, believe. Mm. And I know yeah. for a fact that not only am I generally incapable of doing that, but I don't want to. I need to, It needs to be clear to the person I'm talking to at some point in the conversation, not necessarily starting there, and it doesn't even have to get confrontational. For me, it needs to be in there. I don't agree with you. Mm. And I have concerns um, that make me care enough to potentially want to change your mind. Sure, sure. So, okay, yeah. I, I, I totally get what you're saying there. Um, maybe the, 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 the beauty of the conversations that you might see on my channel where you get those reflective moments is because people don't feel like they're encountering an opponent. Like here is somebody who's who's generally interested in what I believe, and they're willing to work with me to figure out why I have the belief. Um, me starting off by saying, "Hey, my name is Anthony. I'm an atheist, and I want to figure out why you believe in a god." The walls will go up. I, I've done that, and you can see it on you can just see it in their body language. You see it in the words. They'll just walk away. They won't even want to have a talk with you. In a way, this kind of goes back to a common criticism of SC is that you're not being you're not being straightforward with people enough to let them know where you stand on that belief. I saw a comment just yesterday on Facebook that said they were baffled that the person you're talking to doesn't know where you're going because it's so obvious and it seems uh, yeah. disingenuous or dishonest. Well, that's, I think that's because, like, I don't know about that commenter, but sure. we, uh, you know, we, we, we live this. We're in the atheist movement, you know we might see where it's going because we're invested in this whole thing, whereas somebody off the street to be being asked might not even pick up on the fact that right oh wow like why is he questioning about my beliefs is this going to is he trying to instill doubt here that was exactly my my thought when i saw that comment is well of course you see where he's going yeah how many of these videos have you watched how many episodes of this have you watched right. how much time you spent on this these right. are these are people right. on the street when i went in to speak to those two universities i did a kind of like an informal straw poll nobody in either or nobody in the classroom that i asked had ever even heard of william lane craig mm. Mm. and they were predominantly christians they had all heard yeah. of dawkins because he had been discussed as part of their homework, but nobody knew who Craig was. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and yet he's the easily one of the one of, if not the foremost Christian apologist yeah. uh, in debate. I don't know if this has ever happened, and, and this is me not being in the SE community because I just do. I really would love it if you would join that group. I really would love it if just, I had enough time just to do it. Lurk. I mean, the posts are so good. Here, here's the thing. Let's say I I decide to go out and do this. What's in my head right now to do? Uh, and I probably wouldn't film it, at least not for a while. Mm-hmm. Is not begin by saying, "Hi, I'm Matt. I'm an atheist. I'd like to know why you believe in God." But get start to start the conversation, asking the questions. I'd like to find out and understand why you believe what you believe. At some point in the conversation, I think the question that I would most like to ask is. What do you think I believe? Mm. Would it surprise you if I to find out I agreed with you? Mm, mm. Would it surprise you to find out I disagreed with you? 
any of those three questions, or perhaps all of them, not only get into this idea of kind of self-reflective thought, but it gets to the intentional stance of looking at, I'm trying to look at it through your eyes. Yeah. Have you for a moment tried to think about where I'm at? Not that it matters. Right. And, and make it clear that, you know, if at the end of this, you know, neither of us have changed our mind, um, I'll consider that a little unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, because one of us has to be right. Or at least we can't both be right. So okay. So when we I have a, both be wrong. when I have an SE conversation, I don't know how many of my videos you've watched, but uh, what I, half a dozen or so probably. Okay, recent ones. Only the one you sent this morning. I don't know how recent that is. Okay, um, what I usually say is uh, I like to have short little conversations with people to identify a belief that you think is true or probably true, and investigate the reasons, the method that you use to conclude that it's true. What are the reasons? How did you determine that it's actually true? Um, by me saying, by the way, you might end up picking a belief that I completely disagree. And so, actually, now that I think about it, I probably have something, said something to the effect of, um, I try to be very neutral on it. I'm going to just ask questions. I'm not going to be telling sure. you what to think. And, and um, I'm going to just listen and ask you questions, and by the end of the talk, you might be less confident, more confident, just as confident in the belief that you hold. That's kind of my little, that's t including the scale, that the scales are part of that too. That's usually how I go about doing it. I don't think I'd have a problem by saying, and I could probably deliver it in a way that wouldn't shut them down to say something like, now, you can pick any belief, I like to talk about supernatural beliefs, but if you were to pick God, or, you know, I, there, you might actually pick a belief that I completely disagree with, but um, it might be interesting at the end of the talk to see, after you give me your reasons why you think it's true, to get a sense of where you think I am on that particular belief. We could do that. I don't have a problem with that. And I have such a directed focus. Um, and, you know, there's, I, I'm not even sure if I have a style. There's a style that I've cultivated over the years, and it's different if we I'm want, on an airplane. We, but we want different styles from people. Yes. like. I do think there's some merit in people watching the videos and mimicking what Anthony does. Yeah, don't be Anthony. Don't please don't take take things from his stuff, things from my stuff, things from somebody else's stuff, and then come up with your own ideas. Mod it, make it because your own. Because if if you find a better way, we we would like to know. That's yeah, uh, exactly. I know from from me not only asking them, hey, do you think what do you think I believe? Mm -hmm. Um. But also, one of the questions that I would throw in that has nothing to do with the specifics, and I would probably do this 90% of the time, is to ask them, do you care if you're right? Do you care about yeah. truth? Yeah. How would we go about finding out which was is right? If you were confident, as, if, you were, if you were incredibly confident that you were correct, and that this belief is important, and that I'm wrong, how would you go about changing my mind? How would you go about exposing to me that I'm wrong? Do you even care that I might be holding a belief that's not true? And that's that to me is 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 critical because there are plenty of people who will say, you know, oh, I'm incredibly confident that God exists, but I don't care what you believe. It doesn't matter to me. Oh. And yeah. I don't have that belief. I also don't have like 100% confidence that there isn't a God. Uh, I might be stuck at 50-50 depending on how we define terms. But I care what other people believe because their beliefs inform their actions and their actions. Right. Play. I would like to live in a world full of reasonable people. I would like to be one of them. I'd like to find out if I'm not. If I'm wrong, I want to know. That's right. And if somebody came up to me and says, do you care if I'm wrong about this? My answer almost all the time is going to be yes. Absolutely. There are a handful of things that someone could be wrong about and I'm not going to care at all. You know, like, Certainly, you can, well, you can't really just be wrong about opinions. I mean, we, we might the disagree about the proper cooking temperature best. of a frozen pizza. They might think it's two twenty five when it's probably more about four twenty. They could be wrong about it. It probably doesn't affect you all that much. It probably doesn't. But if you're wrong about the proper cooking temperature for a pizza, and you cook it at the wrong temperature, and you could end up getting food poisoning. Good point. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, uh, but if it was something completely, you know, like. Hey, green socks are better than red socks. Mm. Uh, that's just an opinion. Okay, yeah. As far as I can tell, you can't be wrong about... So, that's interesting because, yeah, there's a, there's a certain assumption when I talk to people that they have a similar value of truth as I do. And not everybody does. 
and I don't you get callers like that and I talk to people where I could be 10 minutes into a conversation where they've established a belief and they've established where they are in terms of their confidence in that belief only to find out that everyone can have their own truth oh. and that that just so I think it was Thomas Paine who said that um, trying to reason with someone who's abandoned reasoning is like trying to administer medicine to the dead I have that on my Twitter. Yeah, if you can't get to, if somebody says, "Hey, oh, I absolutely care if it's true," but what they mean by true is yeah, yeah. so dramatically different. Well, it's true for me, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been experimenting. There, there's this one guy I've been working with. It's interesting because the videos are getting noticed by experts in different fields. So people familiar in, um, in NLP and motivational interviewing and psychology and critical thinking and filming people in public like all these various experts are coming in and giving me suggestions which is great because then I can roll them out into the field and one of the suggestions was before you even get into what the person believes you need to really get a sense of where they are in terms of their value of truth because if somebody doesn't value truth you've got a larger issue before yeah. getting into why they think a God exists or they think karma is real. I believe this and my reasons don't matter at all unless my reasons are tied to truth. Did you see the video that I did with the woman on the trail? Uh, she said that everyone can have their own truth and I reached out and snatched her water bottle. Yes. Did you see that? I think, I think you yeah, showed It was just a little tiny little uh, short yeah. little clip. But, but um, yeah, so many people... But here's the thing. The people that say that everyone has their own truth and truth is an opinion don't live that way. No. Nobody They does. would never leave their house. Yeah. It, it, that denial of truth or that thing of personal truth um, is, I think, more of a defense mechanism to, ha to avoid having to defend beliefs. Because as soon as you say it's true it's like, for me... It's, being like, it's almost like being pacifist or I need to be so accommodating that... I'm going to allow anyone to have their own reality. Yeah. Well, that's my camera, and it's currently recording. You and I would agree on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know for sure it's your camera. True. And it looks like it might be recording. But go ahead. We'll check it later. Yeah. Uh, if it's not recording, we're completely screwed. Uh, but to sit here and say, oh, well, you know, that's true for you. But what's true for me is that it's my camera. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's Anthony's camera and it's recording. Uh, now we've got a big problem because our truths are not only in conflict, they're in conflict over something that we're both claiming ownership of. Right, right. And so, you know, what do we do then? Because if you say, okay, we're going to go to the authorities, well, going to the authorities is true for you, but I it's actually, not true for me. I actually me. went to the authorities and they told me that it is mine. So. Well, those are your authorities in your truth. In my truth, my authorities yeah. said that your authorities aren't authorities. Yeah, this this is a real big problem. And I don't... It's, 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 I, I, I just think, again, this goes back to a lot of people never really giving a lot of thought to yeah. the beliefs that they have in their head. Especially think, the people that claim about, that claim the subjective truth. I think I think the true thing is, as soon as somebody says it, um, I'm happy to continue. We have to set aside everything we were talking about, and now we can only talk about truth. Yeah. Now we can exactly. talk about you know, and, and what, what can we agree on. And I've had good discussions with a few people about truth, where I've actually started off by saying, um, I like to have talks with people about what they believe, but but I'd really like to first understand what your definition of truth is. What is what does true mean to you? And then if they say, well, it's a fact, it's something that's real, then I might move on to the second step, which yeah. is what do you believe? But if they say, oh, um, well, you know, I have my own truth, and I look around, and, and if it feels good, it's true, and, and you know, you can really have your own truth, then I know that we might have a larger issue, and it, it, it would be a waste of time to move on. Yeah, this, we are stuck having to interpret reality yeah. based on our experiences. But if we have this blind primacy of experience to where if I experience it, it's necessarily true, now we're making a mistake because... You come and tell me, hey, I saw a ghost last night. I'm happy to believe that you saw something or you had some experience mm -hmm. and that your ac m best, most accurate explanation of it is I saw a ghost. That doesn't mean I believe you actually saw a ghost. I'm happy to believe you had some experience. It's your interpretation of that experience that I'm questioning. Mm -hmm. And that's all we can ever do. 
how do we then go out and investigate? You know, we can look up the serial number on the camera and see where it was registered. You know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so I want to I want to kind of wrap this up and and close with some thoughts. I touched on a minute ago, one of the reasons to do this is that I'll be traveling and I know a lot of other people will be engaging with families and having conversations, yes. some of them potentially religious, some of them political. Um, doing what I do on the show probably isn't the best thing to make your holiday season pleasant. Um, I, I say that. There are things I've done on the show which would be perfectly acceptable. But what I find is that something like street epistemology or merely just using a non-confrontational Socratic approach where perhaps you're sitting down and, you know, your uncle is talking about how his church got together and we raised a bunch of money and we gave money to the homeless and then we went and told them all about Jesus. And my inclination generally is I'm not going to say anything at, at the beginning. And tell something is so egregious that I can't, I can't mm. stop myself from talking. But if they say to me, "What have you been doing?" and "What do you think about that?" Okay, they open the door for you. Yeah, that that's going to happen for people that would be watching this video and that have watched your videos of mine. Um, and that's a common question that I get too: is I see you on the street talking to strangers. What about my wife? Yeah, uh, I have a, a, a wife who's a believer, or I've got an uncle that I'm going to be going to their house for the holidays. How do I handle him? And, and I, I will probably end up writing a blog post about it or maybe doing a, a, a video about it. I mean, it could probably even be book-worthy, honestly, because it's such a big deal. But I think the method would be pretty much the same. You don't have to, you don't have to do the scale. You don't have to you know, say things verbatim like you might see in the videos. But you can even say, hey, I, I've been watching these videos of street epistemology, and it's this like Socratic approach of asking questions and it's pretty in interesting. Do you mind if I ask you this thing that you've just said, can we unpack it a little bit? And I'm gonna, I might sound a little different, I'm gonna be asking these questions. You don't have to hide the fact that you're using street epistemology, there's nothing to hide. So you can just come out and, and just prep them and say, I wanna start asking you some questions. But How uh, many times do people accuse you of using trick questions? Um, not the people that I'm speaking with, but I, I do get comments on videos of people that say that. Okay. And they're usually... I, I was looking at the people you're speaking with because... I, I Nobody. Okay. I, I don't think I've ever had somebody uh, during a conversation say, these are just... You're just trying to trap me. Rarely. But it's it's usually believers that watch it that then, say... Then that may well be one of the biggest positives. Um, it may be a problem in that when we're talking about whether or not it's apathetic, whether or not it goes far enough towards, you know, caring about whether somebody believes and, and, and encouraging them to perhaps change their mind, um, to never be accused of using trick questions to get people to realize something could be an incredibly wonderful thing mm -hmm. that is useful, or it could be an indicator that something's not going far enough because people haven't been challenged. Mm. Well, I definitely think when people are done talking with me, they feel like their beliefs have been challenged. And But it's weird. It's like challenged in a way that was gentle enough to like not leave me quivering in a bowl of jelly, like a bowl of jelly. Yeah. But like, wow, that was really interesting. I really liked that talk. That was cool. How can we talk again? That's usually the response that I get. And I, I think that you can do that too with family members, just to circle back to that, that whole thing I, that we wanted to I've do. done something... Um, that, you know, most people, I'm not that interested in one-on-one -on -one conversations. Really? Not, not in the sense that most people would think. Um, because I'm a huge proponent that there's a, I'm unlikely to change any individual's mind, but if there's an audience, and actually you're not, because you're posting the videos. There's a whole there, different dynamic there. I'd love to get into that if we can. But if somebody comes up to me and says, oh, I, I'd love to have a private debate with you. Oh, yeah. Uh, then my response most of the time is, why on earth couldn't we do it in a public? Mm -hmm. um, because yeah. I, I have limited time. And so if I sit down and I talk to one person for an hour, and it's not recorded, and there's no audience. Yeah. Um, I may change their mind. I may not. They may change my mind. They may not. I've been, you know, I've been doing this for a while. So 
it's not that I don't care about people on a one-on-one thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's an efficiency thing. I get, you, I get you totally. And it's about trying to make sure that if I'm going to put all the effort into having this conversation and going through it, plus the odds are the person I'm talking to believes things, the same things or similar things for similar reasons to the next 20 people who are going to want a one-on-one conversation. Mm. And so I don't just link to that in, other thing. engage in it that much. But what I will say is on the occasions where I do, people have noticed on the show, I do things a couple of different ways. And in debates, like a public formal debate, that looks slightly different. There's, it's not like I'm Jekyll and hiding or anything, but there's a, there's a tactic. And first of all, you know, you're, you've got a structure and I have respect for the debate yeah. format and, and I want um, to put forward the best well, I'm always trying to put forth the best I can. And then if you saw me in a conversation with somebody one-on-one, whether it's on a plane, um, and especially if it's a family member, I, I don't think you would find me unrecognizable. I think you would see elements of all of this repeated. Um, but I'm not going to be as confrontational. I had an opportunity to see you engage with a believer when we were outside the steps of the uh, the Capitol building. I can't remember what we were protesting, <laughs> like the, the National Day of Prayer, or the, the Day of Prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was that woman who was, she was talking to me a little bit, and then I, I noticed you talking to her. And yeah, you, you yeah, you were having a conversation with her. And it was awesome. Yeah, it, was, it was great. So yeah, I think we do have different styles depending on the venue that we're in, depending on the audience. When I'm having a conversation with somebody on the street using street epistemology, I have a camera on, and as I'm asking the questions, I'm also thinking about how is this going to be perceived by the thousands right. of people that will be watching it. So in a way, like a lot, I get pe- people ask me all the time, how can you be so patient? Well, it helps knowing that my work will be watched by people who will call me out on my bullshit if I am a total jerk to that person. First of all, it helps, like you mentioned before, it, and I've given the same advice. First of all, you should care about the kind, about, about yeah. the kind of world you live in, the person you're talking to. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you don't, if you're doing this to show that you are superior. smarter or superior, uh, first of all, I think you're going to completely suck at street epistemology. You might be okay at you know, the, the hammering debate style, but I don't know that somebody could engage in that sort of non-confrontational Socratic dialogue. And have a goal of, ah, I'm going to make you look so foolish. Right. Because when I have a conversation with somebody, and it's a, I try, it, we start off as interviews, but it usually morphs into conversations where sure. they like, now what do you believe? And then I tell them. Um, I want to meet with them again. I want to keep ex- sticking with the belief that they have and, and seeing that conversation to fruition. If, if, I'm a, if I am hostile with them, if I'm a jerk, they probably not want to meet with me again. So I try to, I do try I to. Yeah. So when I was talking about one-on-one conference, I, 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 I've experimented. Hmm. There's a Christian gentleman in town who invited me to lunch a couple of years ago and wanted to talk to me about religion. Mm-hmm. So we had a conversation. We did another lunch. We did another lunch. We did another lunch. Over the course of the last couple of years, we've done a handful of lunches. We've talked about, he'll say, this week I'd like to talk about prophecy. Mm. So I'll compare some notes. We go off. It takes a lot of time. It was, it was a way to get a really nice sushi lunch, too. Yeah. But he and I, I, I mean, I, I like him. I haven't had a chance to, to, he asked me to lunch not too long ago, but my schedule wouldn't allow it. But I'm not engaged. I'm not really doing street epistemology. I don't, I don't hold back. Mm-hmm. You know, if, I, if I'm like, no, this is absolute. I'm convinced this is wrong and immoral and blah, blah, blah. I will say that to the point where one of the lunches, he was in tears a little bit. Mm-hmm. Now, when that happens, of course, you know, you take a step back and, hey, maybe we've got a lot to think about. And let's, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I think that the number one rule is to care. And whether you're doing street epistemology or even what I was doing at that lunch, it, he knew I cared. He knew I cared about what he thought, what he believed. I, he knew I cared about him as a person. Mm-hmm. And when things became a little too emotional, the clear demonstration that I cared was, hang on, we don't, we don't have to go the, this far. Back I'm off, just giving, telling you what I believe. Sorry if I, yeah. you know. Yeah, giving people the time 
to move at the pace that they're comfortable with is is key for SE, I think. And uh, I, I've had some encounters with people that have, you know, that have started crying because they were actually a little further in their journey towards non-belief, I think, than I had expected. And perhaps than they realized. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that realization was like, you know, she started crying. I was like, I actually wanted to reach out and, you know, touch the, some stranger on the wood, in this wooded trail. And, you, you know, what's this guy doing? <laughs> but, um... He's stealing my water bottle. Th- yeah. This kind of goes to the last stage of this whole thing, which I think is being there for people when they when they need it, which is why I like to give a card with my contact information. I, I'm already going out and initiating talks. I don't want to be like, you know, give me your email so I can write you. I'd like to just say, here's my contact information. Sure. You can contact me if you want. We can go at this however you want. And oftentimes people do contact me and say, let's meet again, or I want to clarify this definition, or you've significantly helped me lower my confidence in this belief. That way they get to opt into a conversation. That's right. I, it's at their speed. So when you're out on an airplane, on the street, or even over the holiday season, you're talking to your family, uh, we, we've already given you the most important things to, to care, uh, to try to treat people decently and, and be a decent human being. But you can go, what's, give, give them the websites, both for Sri Epistemology and for your stuff, so they can go find out, see examples of this, to pick out the things. You, you, we're not saying, oh my gosh, everybody go do Sri Epistemology now. You can, by all means. Uh, but like we were saying earlier, there are, at a minimum, there are things that you can pick out of it to see a, a way that may be different from what you're doing that's worth trying worst thing you can have that can happen is that you can find out it's not for you or this doesn't work. You're not particularly suited for that. And that's okay because not everybody is suited for a public speaking at all or a big public formal debate. Uh, some people only do written debates because they want the time to stop and think about things and make sure they structure a response. Thinking on the fly and quickly and being able to come up with questions, um, it's not for everybody. But I would say it's a skill that you can develop. Go, well, I would say go back and look at the early episodes of the Atheist Experience, but don't. Uh, I say the same thing with yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. Don't go back. Just just look at the most recent. Uh, but anyway, tell us where we can find out more about street epistemology, about your work, etc. Yeah, sure. So uh, just if I could just add just real quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do think that um, this might not be for everybody. People maybe just would rather somebody make a claim and just let it go and not engage with them. But if it bothers you, if you actually want to help, then try to engage with them. Um, there are so many tools available today that weren't available when I started doing this. So there's there's very little excuse to not do it if you want to. Um, you can go to the Street Epistemology, streetepistemology.com website. There is the, there's a link to everything related to Street Epistemology from that website. You can find the private Facebook group. There's a Twitter feed. There are... There are almost 10 different YouTube channels that are now going out and doing this across the world. There's a guy in France. There's a couple people in Los Angeles. Hmm. There's somebody on the East Coast. And uh, they are using street epistemology. They're incorporating their own style. Some people sit down at a little table, and they do little interviews there. Another person stands on a, on a little hiking trail. Um, different different venues, everything. And they all ha- they all bring something a little bit unique to it, and that's what we need. We need people to be experimenting with it reporting their findings, and and helping us figure out if this works or not. It seems to be the case. What if it needs a better name? What don't you like about the name? I don't know. Yeah, You know, actually, I don't like the word street in it. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 uh, that pigeon holds us right from the start. It associates us with being street preachers. It gives the impression that you have to be out on the street. Um, Maybe it's hip, though, because like with David Blaine and the street match, eh? Yeah. <laughs> We're doing street epistemology. I, a, I'm not. I'm not all of that concerned about the name, <laughs> but it was one of those things that popped into my head. That's like you know, is that actually what we're doing? Well, we're not always on the street, and and, and well, I say we, but um, there's a is epistemology something you do? There's a couple a couple of the new channels that I've mentioned that are starting. One's called Cordial Curiosity. The other one is called. Um, there's a couple different names where just by uh, philosophist se is another one um so these are people that that are they're still using street epistemology but they're sort of rebranding it in their own little way 
which is good. Like we want variety because yeah, street epistemology might might confuse people or but also, give the wrong impression. The name doesn't matter because you don't walk up and say, "Hi, I'm Anthony, and I would like to try some street epistemology <laughs> on you." I mean, that's probably not the best way to start the conversation. No, I don't usually. I don't do that ever. But only in the last few videos have I because people are like, "What are you doing? What's what is all this? This is really interesting." And then I say, "Well, now I'm actually starting to use the word street epistemology because I think we've gotten past." There seems to be enough of a momentum now where I think people are, most people in the atheist movement, I think, understand that this is not preaching, that um, that this is a Socratic method. And I'm a little more comfortable saying the word street epistemology today than I think I was two and a half years ago. I'd say it's yet another way to try to have better conversations about what you what you think about the world and where you, where you do or don't agree. Yeah, I think so. On that note, thanks, Anthony, for coming out and hanging out with us. We'll do it again sometime. We'll be back uh, next year. And I think what we're we're supposed to do in January, although don't hold me to it, um, I think Alex Malpass and Ozymandias Ramses II are going to get together with me, and they're going to correct me on all the things I'm wrong about philosophically. So, see you later. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.